The peak of fashion for comfortable midsize frame SUVs remained in the late 90s and early 2000s, but it cannot be said that this class has completely left the game. Few cars are equally appropriate both on forest dirt roads and in business center parking lots. The tone in this segment is traditionally set by the Japanese and Americans, but since the beginning of the 2000s, China has been trying to get some share. One of the most successful Chinese-made frames was the Great Wall Hover, but it can be considered a relatively budget option, focused more on practicality than comfort. But the Havel H9 is a completely different matter. With it, the Chinese applied for entry into a higher class. What did they end up with and what did not? And did the owners of these cars feel an increase in class? You can answer these questions by reading reviews. Let's get on with this. The Havel brand appeared in 2013 as a division of the Great Wall Company and was initially positioned as a manufacturer of exclusively crossovers and SUVs and aimed at entering the premium segment. The origin of the name Havel was explained by Chinese marketers who are prone to a poetic perception of the world with the English phrase I have all, that is, I have everything, and explained that everything is a strong family, interesting work, true friends, and a reliable car. Well, almost the first embodiment of this concept was the Havel H9 shown at the Beijing Motor Show, the production of which started at a plant in the city of Baoding. The car had a frame structure, an independent suspension of the front axle, and a dependent rear axle with Eaton locking. Initially, either a 2-liter GW 4C28 gasoline turbo engine with a capacity of 251 horsepower was placed under the hood, or a 190 horsepower GW 4D20T turbo diesel of the same volume. During the first months, a six-speed hydromechanical box worked with them, but already in 2015, the car received an ultra-modern at that time 8-speed automatic ZF8 HP. The model was well equipped with comfort options and was presented in 5 and 7 seater versions. China is a rather closed country and the name of the designer who worked on the H9's appearance remains unknown to the general public. Nevertheless, this work can be called quite successful. The car turned out to be very similar to its main competitor, the Land Cruiser Prado, but without a single direct borrowing. In the fall of 2014, the car was shown at Maya's, and in 2015 its official sales began in Russia, while for tax reasons the gasoline engine was derated to 245 horsepower. At first, the implementation was neither shaky nor roll, the rather high, for a Chinese brand, price and the underdevelopment of the dealer network affected. So, in 2016, only 72 were sold, and in 2017, 180 such cars. In 2017, the car underwent a slight restyling, but the real breakthrough began in 2019, when the assembly of the H9 was launched at the company's Tula plant. Sales picked up quickly, reaching 2,697 units in 2021. Restyling also had an effect. Under the hood of cars of the 2021 model year, an updated version of the 2-liter GW 4C20B turbo engine appeared, the power of which was reduced to 218 horsepower, with a simultaneous increase in torque from 350 to 380 nanometers, the power steering was replaced with an electric booster, a forced lock of the same Eaton brand appeared in the front axle, and the functionality of many electronic driver assistants also increased. Alas, the cost of the H9 is growing along with its popularity, and the situation in the financial and automotive markets only accelerates the rise in prices. Depending on the configuration, new cars of this model cost from 4.9 to 5.3 million rubles. But there is a secondary market. There, for H9 2015 to 2016, they asked for February 2nd, 65 million, and for 2017 to 2020, 2.6 to 2.7 million. It's also solid, but it's still significantly less than the 4.5 to 5 million that sellers want for fresh cars after the second restyling. But is it worth paying attention to the H9 with mileage? Let's see what their owners write in their reviews. Hate number five, trunk. When a person buys a midsize frame SUV, he clearly assumes some kind of long-distance field trips with barbecues, tents, awnings, and folding furniture. Or go fishing. Or a trip to the country. 
In any case, a large car and the luggage compartment should be of the appropriate size. But in the situation with the Havel H9, expectations may not come true. The fact is that in many markets a car of this class and size can only succeed if it has a third row of seats. There is also an H9. Alas, the folded third row seats greatly increase the height of the floor and reduce the volume. The owners complain, in the trunk, a lot of space is eaten up by the third row of seats. If it is unfolded, then you are without a trunk, if not, then the floor is higher than in the TLC 200 inch, I was expecting a more spacious trunk, but since there are three rows of seats and there is only such equipment, there is nowhere to go yet. We have to fold the second row of seats to fit all the fishing gear. The author of one of the reviews notes with surprise that in the significantly smaller Havel H6 crossover, the trunk turned out to be more than 100 liters voluminous. And I would not call the turn you without a trunk an exaggeration. In a seven-seater configuration, the volume available for stowage of luggage is only 112 liters. Nevertheless, the authors of the reviews admit that, in fact, the trunk is well organized, there are niches and compartments for tools, a jack, a first aid kit, and cigarette lighter wires. But in the cabin there are not enough niches and shelves, there is a glove box and a box armrest, but there is nowhere to put the phone. But, according to them, there is a cigarette lighter with a microlift and half torpedo glass holders, only the wash basin is not enough. There are a number of other complaints as well. For example, several reviews noted that in order to expand the third row of seats, you need to remove the curtain covering the trunk. There's nowhere to put it away after that. In short, before buying it is better to carefully evaluate whether the trunk will meet your needs. Love number five, patency. If your plans include some off-road exercises, quite serious, but without real extreme, then the H9 will suit you. This is proved by journalistic test drives, including ours, and reviews on the internet. In the off-road arsenal, a long travel suspension, a Borg Warner transfer case with a reduction gear of 1, 2.56, an excellent Eaton rear differential lock with a hydraulic drive, high torque engines, both diesel and gasoline, a frame. Well, the latest restyling added the ability to block the front axle. Blocking of the same manufacturer, but with an electric drive. Plus, there was an off-road cruise control, cruise control off-road, which allows you to simply press a key in difficult situations, take your feet off the pedals, and focus on steering. In a word, everything is serious, and only not the most heroic ground clearance, equal to 206 millimeters, can inspire some doubts. However, the owners in their reviews unanimously assure that if your plans do not include participation in extreme trophy raids, then you can safely cast aside doubts, those like a tank, H9 passability impressed me. Just an awesome car, comma I really liked the off-road cruise control for an SUV, in the form in which it was implemented, comma I tried full locks on black soil and I am very impressed with this unit, comma the off-road qualities are impeccable, I drove through snow, mud in the field, dry potholes. Panazekoi and blocking used a few times. A very interesting feature, the car jumps out of the mud and does not burrow. In many reviews, the authors describe specific life situations that the H9 not only coped with, but coped with honor. I drove to the country house on virgin snow 30 centimeters deep on studded tires in the low mode. Another describes how he decided to get to the dacha through a snowy field. In a snowstorm, I climbed forward on fresh loose snow 40 to 50 centimeters deep. It was not clear from the car. I got out to see where I was, and then I estimated that the snow was higher than the number. I thought I would have to run after the tractor, but the tractor was eventually called by a neighbor who tried to drive onto the track in his Prado 150, and could not. I couldn't at all. It is worth, of course, to understand that in order to reach the intended point on the map, you need to soberly evaluate both your capabilities and the capabilities of the car, because no one has cancelled the truth of the saying the cooler the jeep, the farther to run after the tractor. Hate number four, winter trouble. It should also be recognized that winter brings the owners of Havel H9 not only a sense of confidence in the ability to overcome snowdrifts, but also some troubles and inconveniences. Firstly, many owners note a certain slowness in warming up the car interior, 
the interior heats up for a long time 15 to 20 minutes after 15 to 20 minutes of driving the interior just starts to warm up and not only owners of diesel versions complain about this there would be nothing unexpected in this everyone knows that diesel engines take longer to heat up but also those who have a gasoline turbo engine under the hood there are no problems for the driver in a couple of minutes the steering wheel heats up entirely in a circle and the seat and not only the pillow but also the back but the passengers have to freeze for some time in fact the authors of many reviews write that it was not in vain that they spent money on installing a preheater it not only facilitates starting in cold weather but also dramatically reduces the time for warming up the air in the cabin alas there is no regular heater in the car secondly in a lot of reviews the authors complain about the operation of the wiper blades i made sure that the wipers on the car are not suitable for winter operation they quickly freeze while becoming an arc and stop cleaning the windshield rubber on janitors become dull in the cold and frameless brushes do not adhere well to the glass but in order to clean the glass from sticky dirt mixed with de-icing reagents it needs to be watered and here again an ambush when driving i turn on the washers and they abundantly water only the lower cut of the windshield jet nozzles of the windshield washer are a natural jam for such a car you need fan ones but most of all the owners are most annoyed by the sensor locks of the door handles that fail in the cold and if the door locks are opened from the key fob then real problems begin with the fifth door a standard sore when the tailgate handle is covered with a mixture of wet snow and dirt then until you wipe it off do not open it from the outside in wet cold weather the trunk handle fails you need to dry it with a napkin and warm it by hand the tailgate in principle works only on the sensor so it cannot be opened mechanically with a button or key a couple of times i got so that it did not open at all the owners cope with this misfortune as best they can someone advises changing the battery in the key someone writes that they solved this problem by locking slash unlocking the car and the sensor seemed to reset after that someone advises wiping the pen with a dry cloth and then everything works many claim that the problem was solved by sealing the handle however the most radical solution is to lay an additional wire from the door so that the trunk can be opened by pressing a button on the key fob but with winter corrosion h9 copes with a solid five i don't often wash off winter dirt but chrome is in perfect order the chrome inserts on the doors below have faded in some places there are spots from the reagents but if you do not look closely they are not visible there is no rust anywhere chrome on the doors in several places last winter tried to bloom over the course of a year i treated myself with protection for chrome two or three times each time it took about five minutes i didn't see any more problems love number four interior quality soundproofing and equipment another common place that is found in almost all reviews is the friendly enthusiasm about the comfort and quality of the cabin the chairs are soft comfortable with clearly defined lateral support to the distance the song there are practically no complaints about ergonomics except that some owners complain that the right knee rests on hard plastic when moving my knee rests on the tide of the start stop button on the dashboard to combat this inconvenience i bought a small soft leather pad but otherwise everything is fine so much so that some owners even believe in the naturalness of not only leather but also all aluminum with wood everything is solid inside soft nappa leather aluminum natural veneer varnish high quality assembly the machine is inside super everything is worthy soft quiet comfortable modern functional very cool interior nappa leather sandalwood soft plastic rubberized handles knobs velvet inside the glove box lighting at the same time everything is clearly assembled nothing does not creak or dangle quality at the same time which is nice the interior is durable here the owner of the car writes after five years of operation the interior is ideal there are no scratches even at the back where the dachshund sometimes rides the steering wheel is slightly rubbed but everything shiny in the cabin is shiny all the leds are lit in all the prescribed colors all the skin is without creases and cracks there is not a single squeak anywhere i don't take care of the interior only sometimes i wipe the panels with wet wipes 
The owners of the car are also pleased with the equipment of the car with a variety of modern systems. The list of modern options is decent. A gearshift joystick, a rotary by Xenon, a start-stop system, an infinity sound system, pressure and temperature control in each tire separately, paddle shift paddles, parking mode, and etc. etc. There is no point in listing everything. It really makes no sense to list everything, it's easier to look at the company's website and see how the comfort, elite, and premium trim levels differ. In their reviews, the authors note the creator's attention to detail and praise the rear view camera, parking sensors, the right mirror that goes down when moving backwards, the interior mirror with dimming, however, many recommend removing the middle headrest of the rear row of seats that interferes with the view. I also like the multifunction steering wheel with convenient buttons. I used to sometimes drive the Avensis and the new E-Class, and in both cases the buttons on the steering wheel depressed me, especially on the Yeshka. There is a touch-sensitive knob, and I constantly crawled on it, accidentally switched something there and suffered wildly from it, but there is no such thing on Kavala. Of course, pre-styling cars have a slightly smaller set of options, they lack a 360 camera, adaptive cruise control, there are more than enough morons on the road to long distances, and seat ventilation, it should be mandatory on the skin in summer, writes one of the authors. And still, according to the owners, in terms of comfort and equipment, the H9 outperforms all its competitors, primarily Mitsubishi Pajero Sport, as well as Toyota Fortuner and Prado. Well, a separate pride of Chinese engineers can be an unexpectedly high level of acoustic comfort for a frame SUV. The authors of a significant proportion of reviews consider soundproofing almost the main advantage of the model. Cool soundproofing with a diesel engine on winter tires on asphalt at 100 km slash H you can talk without raising your voice. I liked everything, especially the chassis and shunker you drive like an electric car. Amazing noise isolation, actually S-Class. If the engine is not turned up to 6,000, despite the visually thin windows in the doors, noise isolation, no Toyotas. We're even nearby. And so on, and stuff like that. The only thing that confuses the authors is what this sound insulation is made of. There is a hatch in the trunk through which you can look inside and see a thick plate of hollow fiber or synthetic winterizer by eye with a thickness of centimeters 15 to 20. So, the authors of these reviews are afraid that with the temperature difference and high humidity, moisture condensation will occur there, which means active corrosion. Fortunately, so far these fears have not been confirmed. Hate number three, light steering, rutting. As already mentioned, the owners like the steering wheel itself, comfortable and grippy. But the steering settings cause quite serious complaints. The fact is that the Havel H9 steering wheel is very light, but at the same time sharp. On the one hand, this is not bad, you do not need to make amplitude movements when rebuilding. And on the other, the car listens to the slightest movement, this is very good and convenient in the city, but at speed it is wrong. A little distracted, and you already cling to the neighboring lane, and it's really annoying, it's worth a little distraction on the way to SMS on the phone or switching the station, as you are already leaving the lane, the owners write in their reviews. The situation is aggravated by the fact that the car is very sensitive to longitudinal rutting. If you get into a rut on the Moscow Ring Road at speed, then you can easily fly to another lane. In a word, what is convenient for slow movement in the city, maneuvers in the parking lot or when overcoming off-road obstacles can seriously interfere on the highway. Love number three, ride, suspension. Sensitivity to rutting is, of course, a minus, but in the main work of the Havel H9 suspension, the owners give more than a positive assessment, first of all, for the smoothness of the ride, pits on the road, they simply don't exist anymore, Havel is better than Rexton, the suspension is comfortable reliable on any dead roads and without them, both in winter and summer. I am surprised at the suspension of the car on the potholes of a dirt and gravel road, forests and meadows. Super. Well, here is such an unexpected comparison. Before Havel, I drove a Lexus sedan. The driving experience is about the same. Naturally, such a soft and very long travel suspension is not very suitable for reckless assault on tight corners. But the authors of the reviews believe that everything is fine within this class, throws the stern. 
she is thrown no more than on the same Prado, and to understand this, it is enough to stop reading all sorts of nonsense and drive this car. This is a frame shed with a continuous rear axle and not an understated Puzaterco with independent suspension. What did you want? In general, a solid suspension, strong, any mention of the need for intervention is extremely rare in reviews, moderately soft. And about the suspension travel, I can say that during the test in the Caucasus, I hardly managed to find a place where I really it was necessary to use blocking bridges. Hate number two, interface and other little things. In their reviews, the authors do not write about any serious sores that require a lot of time and money. But there are enough minor flaws related to the interface and the operation of the software. Most often, owners are annoyed by the seat heating control algorithm. You need to press a button on the panel and then select the degree of heating on the monitor. A sort of intricate multi-way. People are terribly strained by the interface of the multimedia system, especially when heated seats. The minus is the control of seat heating from the screen. And in general, the owners of the multimedia device don't like the interface very much, especially in the case of pre-styling cars, about the head unit, which has no navigation, and some comfort functions in the car are turned on only through it. I won't say anything at all the feeling is that it is somewhere sometimes it lay in a warehouse for 10 years, and then the Chinese bought it cheaply and stuck it in their wonderful car. In some reviews, the authors recommend replacing the head unit with something else, Instead of the native radio, I installed Tay CC3. It is on Android. You can install any programs. The screen is much larger than the native one. The only drawback is that the seat heating mode is not displayed. There are other minor bugs as well. Here one of the owners writes in his review, when the light is turned off, it constantly gives an error about burned out running lights, but they work properly. They can't do it in the service, they say it's a logical bug in the computer. Or this oddity is also clearly of a programmatic nature. When the car is running and the key is in the passenger compartment, it is impossible to open the rear tailgate, you have to either turn off the engine or take the key with you. But all this is not fatal at all, and one can get used to this kind of oddity. Love number two, dynamics and consumption. A person who buys a heavy frame SUV of a classic design is unlikely to expect such a car to be a constant winner of traffic lights races, and on the track it will behave like a sports coupe. Nevertheless, in the vast majority of reviews, the authors name the dynamics among the advantages of the Havel H9, or in the worst case, they write that it suits them quite well. This applies to both diesel and gasoline versions. I drive a car dynamically, and the 8-speed automatic gearbox pleases, it works adequately and on time, in the sport mode it is quite peppy. It is clear that the car is dynamic on the bottoms, but obviously not for racing, I was worried about the dynamics when overtaking on the track. Not a bullet, of course, but quite good, especially if you drop a couple of gears down with the paddle on the left, the car is frisky, at traffic lights Prado. TLC 200, Pajero, you can leave it behind if you are in the mood. In general, most of the reviewers are quite positive about the consistency of both engines and the machine, although there are certain nuances. Acceleration from standstill takes very cheerfully, as the owners write, acceleration to hundreds, according to their feelings, takes 9 to 10 seconds. It seems especially unusual with almost complete silence in the cabin. I press the pedal, looking, and already 80 kilometers slash h with the allowed 60. At a speed of 100 kilometers slash h, the tachometer shows 1800 RPM, that is, the motor does not strain. It is curious that the owners do not notice much difference in the dynamics of the 245 and 218 horsepower versions. But at higher speeds, everything is not so smooth, oh well, I'm driving, let's say, on cruise 100, I decide to overtake, I press the gas, and nothing happens. After a couple of seconds, the engine reluctantly wakes up and starts to gain momentum, then the box switches to a lower one, by that time I had already changed my mind about overtaking. A double kick down to the floor also does not give a sharp reaction, but still more cheerful. But if you wake up the engine before overtaking, then the responsiveness is satisfactory. There are those who write that the box stopped thinking only after chipping. It would seem that with such dynamics, a large and heavy car should be terribly voracious. But no. 
In the vast majority of reviews, the authors express satisfaction with fuel efficiency. First of all, of course, this applies to diesel versions. The average consumption is 8.6 liters and urban mode 11 to 12 liters slash 100 kilometers. Depending on mood, driving style, and traffic jam density, very economical car in all respects. Consumption for the entire period 8.8 .8 liters, fuel consumption in the summer, Moscow and Gorky Highway, which are all in traffic jams due to eternal repairs, according to the instrument 8.9 to 9 liters per 100 kilometers, consumption above 10 knot rows. Overall 9.1 inch. Gasoline engines are, of course, more voracious. A powerful 245 horsepower version in the city in the summer with air conditioning consumes 14 to 15 L slash 100 kilometers and then if there are few traffic jams and with traffic jams all 16. In winter with warm-ups the consumption reaches 18 to 20 liters per hundred. The 218 horsepower version is noticeably more economical. Consumption consistently shows 12.7 liters per hundred in the city, and this is nice. I went on a long trip for the new year to a village in the Penza region. The speed was 120 to 140, and in this mode the car consumed 12 liters per 100 kilometers. The consumption was recorded on a section of 1,300 kilometers. Naturally, the consumption strongly depends on the driving style. There are reviews in which the owners of such cars write about the average level of fuel consumption at the level of 14 to 14.5 L slash 100 kilometers or even 16 in summer and 18 in winter. However, they also do not consider such an expense to be a disadvantage, especially since the car digests 92 gasoline quite normally. Hate number one, kudos. And now about the sad. During all seven years of the model's presence on the Russian market, the main factor limiting the growth of its sales and popularity was the lack of brand prestige, or rather, the status of a Chinese car in itself. The price also added negativity, or rather, not the price itself or comparing it with the price of competitors of the same class, but the simple unwillingness to pay for a car of a Chinese brand too, then three, and now more than four million rubles. No matter how good the car is in itself, no matter what laudatory reviews journalists and real owners write about it, the mass of others will still repeat, the problem with this car is that it will be difficult to sell it later, there will be a big loss. Well, the boys in the area will not understand, or colleagues will not be considered a successful person. By the way, the thesis about losses has not been justified today. The price growth dynamics for these cars is as incredible as for the rest, and the 2014 to 2016 Havel H9 is more expensive on the secondary market than new cars in those years. Yes, tectonic events in the automotive market are forcing so many to turn their attention to Chinese brands, and a couple of H9s suddenly showed up in the vicinity of my house in Moscow. But the essence of the situation has not changed. Any positive feedback in the virtual space, and, I believe, not only there, immediately leads to the beginning of violent disputes. First, the Chinese haters run in, I don't consider it to be a car at all, whoever has money, they won't take this Chinese they buy the Chinese out of desperation. The realists sluggishly fight back, no matter how hard they try to wax this Chinese, sales are only growing, despite the almost quarterly increase in prices for the entire line. As a child, it seems that a cheap Chinese toy broke, that's an insult to the Chinese for life. But the opponents are not inferior, this bucket does not go in principle. The real owners object to them, this bucket rides great. At least not worse than the diesel Prado and much better than the Prado 2.7. Opponents are using new arguments, an awesome car, but only when it stands in the cabin with concreted wheels so that, God forbid, it doesn't go onto public roads. Like it or not, but no matter how he was Chinese, so he will remain so, the author for such a short period of ownership has not yet known all the delights of the Chinese automobile industry, China is China. And in general, in a couple of years, the car will rust through and turn into red dust, and before that it will not drive, because it will fall apart, and therefore in a year, two or three, it will lose 146% of its value. This is followed by objections, they say, 
Chinese cars are scolded by couch experts who have never sat in these cars, but the owners, who are more and more satisfied with the purchase, as for Havala, the car is really reliable, like a tank, I have Pajero Sport 2019, this is junk, I've only owned it for three months, and the trunk lid has already blown, and the drive belt has been changed three times, but it still whistles. Havel really doesn't even stand next to the Prado, the interior is on a completely different, better level, and the equipment is much better. Probably Prado is a show-off. And here such evidence regarding the attitude towards the car on the road is interesting. They yield without problems. They don't blink behind. I feel calm and safe, but only after tinting and removing the nameplates. It's like moving into a different car. Apparently, there is still something in the psychology of our people. But, as they say, life itself will punish such people severely and force us to accept the fact that a premium car of a Chinese brand is a reality given to us in sensations. Love number one, financial benefits. All of the above means that the axiom more expensive does not mean better in the current Russian reality is becoming more and more relevant, so the first thing to look at is the price-quality ratio. And the Havel H9 is quite good today, and this applies to both new and used cars. If you start considering different options that are similar in terms of year of manufacture, condition, and equipment, then you will inevitably come to the conclusion that all competitors will be about 1 million rubles more expensive, and for comparable money they will be significantly older or in minimum configurations. Plus, according to the owners, the H9 is not ruinous in terms of operation. Firstly, it is quite reliable. I hit 64,000 no problems. Five and a half years, the flight is normal, not a single problem. After the warranty, it is easy to service in any decent service station. A Chinese-made car with a run of 100,000 kilometers produced a feeling of new, interior, body, general feeling, and the rest, with the same run, were noticeably used. For more than 100,000 mileage, I didn't notice any particular problems, except that the light bulb burns out or the battery runs out. The car is unrealistically high. For 70,000, not a single problem. As a matter of fact, there are many times more statements of this kind, and stories like my father-in-law Caval N9 drove about 50,000 kilometers. The gearbox flew off, it was changed under warranty, the fuel hose is constantly torn, carries a spare one with it, therefore it is all filled with diesel fuel or found in single quantities and very rarely. Of particular note is the high corrosion resistance, because body repair requires the most serious financial investments. And here, too, there are laudatory reviews on the verge of garage tales about 10 vol bodies, the paintwork is excellent 130 to 140 microns, and double-sided galvanizing in a circle. Few of the competitors have this, and when the H9 becomes a rusty bucket, it looks like there won't even be holes left from the rest, I didn't find any rot. In the spring I was upset with one saffron milk cap, but at the sink it washed off, turning out to be bitumen and pollen, double galvanized body, not a single point of corrosion even on chips. On the lower edge of the end of the door, the paint is beaten off to the metal, corrosion does not even think of appearing. In many reviews, the authors write about an acceptable price for maintenance, and if a few years ago they complained about the poor development of the dealer network, now the situation is being radically corrected. On the profile forum of owners, participants write that 2122 and other small TOs cost about 10 to 10.5 thousand with consumables and large ones, for example, 24 and 28, about 25 to 30 thousand. But the financial arguments concerning the cost of hull and Osego sound much more weighty. So, a hull on the H9 will cost the owner 67,000 rubles a year, and on a similar Toyota Prado, almost 150. At the same time, as one of the owners writes, no companions are required, the car is not stolen. That is, the accompanying obligatory expenses are minimal, you can get by on a budget, Osego in the region of 7,000 and tax 9,000. In this case, we are talking about the diesel version, because the tax on the 245 strong version in Moscow will already be 18,375 rubles, and on the 218 strong version, 16,350. 
As for liquidity and residual value, there are those among the reviewers who sold their H9 to buy a more recent car of the same brand. So, according to their testimonies, the sale did not take so much time, and the losses were far from the largest. In a word, the words of spiteful critics that in a few years you will be happy if you manage to sell it for 5000 you cannot pay much attention. 